a big thanks to all my Patreons. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we're testing out this, uh, my Project 2067 board. It has a Z8S180 chip and SRAM on it over here. And it plugs with a connector here into an FPGA breakout board, which I call Project 2057, and should be linked to in here, right here. If you want to find these parts, look at the schematic and follow along at home. I'll put links to both of these repos in the description below the video on YouTube. So, where did we leave off? We left off playing around. Now, this website, uh, website, this, this, this Git repo was originally just the hardware stuff for this board that you see in this picture down here. And what I'm doing is I, I made a directory down here called FPGA, and inside there are there's some uh, Verilog-based test applications that I'm playing around with just to verify that the board itself works. We'll move on to a whole other repo when we're writing real software for this, but these are just the proof-of-life uh, type programs just to flip bits and turn on lights and stuff like that to make sure everything's cool. So far I've talked about the no-op spin loop, the loop spin loop, and let's move on now to the uh, Progue subdirectory in here. What happens in this one is I'm going to try and, and see if I can get uh, one of these RAM 4K blocks that holds 512 bytes, right? That's 4K bits, that's what this 4K refers to, the bits, not the bytes. Uh, and then I can maybe use that RAM block. In this case, I'm going to use it as a ROM. So I'm going to use it as a boot ROM for the uh, CPU. So here's the directory that I have checked out. I hopefully don't have any weird things going on in here. Great. So, uh, okay, so here's the goal now. I got, I got two things. One, I want to run it out of the RAM block inside the FPGA, and that's the... That's the FPGA RAM, not the SRAM chip that's on the board. I'm not going to use that yet in this particular application. But what I would like to do is fire up a regular old assembler and assemble this code into binary and then make the binary that comes out of this here source code and make that part of my Verilog program so that the actual assembler output becomes part of the FPGA initialization code that is used to pre-populate that block RAM. So this is really cool. Think about this, right? So here's what the, what, what the Z8S180 is going to run when it boots up. And it's going to do that by the FPGA implementing this Verilog code right here. Now, before I had a multiplexer down here that simply said, if the address is zero, output the byte value that's supposed to be in address zero. And if the address is one, I'll put another byte and so on, based on whatever address came from the Z80, or the Z180 in this case. Okay, now this one, what it's going to do is it's going to output, it's going to do the same thing, but it's going to use this this memory of array of vectors, okay? So I could have created a hard block of the RAM 4K in the FPGA, but this code here will allow the, the, the Yosis Verilog compiler to infer that I want to create a ROM and use a, uh, a memory block if one is available. Okay, so this is what's going on. I declare a 512 byte array of 8 bit values. I have an initial block in here that normally doesn't mean much in Verilog when you're synthesizing something, but on an FPGA, if you're synthesizing for an FPGA, the initial does have certain, it will work, okay? Provided that it's setting initial values to various, you know, reg variable types. And one of the ways you can do this is you can say read mem h in this case, for I want to read a file fill, filled with hex values. Now, I was a little upset when I realized that Remem B, which I've never used until this particular project, 
I thought it meant binary as in binary binary. <laughs> but if you use it on the rom.bin file, which is, you know, binary bits in there, it won't work because apparently the readmemh requires printable ASCII hacks, and that seemed more intuitively obvious to me than the fact that the readmemb tries to read in ASCII binary values. So let me show you what's going on here. Let me compile this. So the readmemh Verilog process in there, right? That's what they call those things that look like functions. With the dollar in front of them, those are system, system tasks. Um, this is what it wants, one hex byte per line. I don't know if you can put spaces in there and space them out. I don't know. I put one per line, it works fine. But if this was uh, read mem B, what it would want to see is a printable ASCII 101, 101, 101, <laughs> printable binary bits. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you got me there. <laughs> so if you get decided to play around with this, keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read this printable hex file that came from the assembler that assembled rom.asm. And I'm going to use that to initialize all the values in here, okay? If there's something in here that, as you can see, there's only a few bytes in there. It didn't have all 512. Uh, the rest of them will all be initialized to zero, I think. In my case, I don't care what they're initialized to, as long as the first ones that I give it are the ones I gave it, okay? So the way this then works is, now... This was a little annoying, and I didn't want to have to throw this in here today, but in order for this to infer that I mean to use a memory block inside the FPGA, it appears that I have to make an edge-sensitive clock to gate the assignment of the data in the RAM to the data bus. Originally, I just assumed that I could just enable it and let it sit there like any asynchronous SRAM and leave the output enable on all the time. And then when I change the address, the output would just, you know, change in, in order. But if you look closely at the documentation for this block RAM that's inside the uh, ICE 140, it has a, a an edge triggered clock that it uses to load the address on the data and for the read uh, bus, this is a dual ported RAM. It is a separate read port and a write port. We're not using the write port other than initializing it, of course. But and even then, it's not really using this. But be that as it may, we're focusing on this. And what we need here is a, a, a positive going edge to let it know when the address here is supposed to be latched into the the uh, RAM block and used to determine what value comes out this port over here. So that was, I, there might actually be a way to do this without that, but I, it wasn't obvious to me how to make that happen. And in order to infer that the uh, this code is supposed to go into a memory block, this apparently is how we have to do this, okay? If I'm wrong, please let me know in the comments below. It'd be nice to have an asynchronous uh, static RAM uh, option for this. We sort of would anyway. Even if this is not using a block RAM, it would just do it using gates and muxes and stuff like that inside the FPGA, but it would use up an awful lot of the LUTs, and eventually we're going to run out of those as we put in all kinds of peripheral drivers and stuff like that. So this is a great lesson <laughs> to have learned here, okay? So one of the interesting things we have to do in this particular uh uh, step along our evolution to using this stuff is we have to find a way to provide this read clock because the Z80 and the S180 don't provide that signal. So here's what I've done. Now I know, because I wrote the thing, that the clock that we supply, the Z8 S180 is right here. We're saying this is the input clock that goes into the 180, right? And it is, uh, we, we have a divide by two clock in here, okay? This is what all this is doing. So we have the hardware clock comes off the oscillator that's on the FPGA breakout board, and it's running at 25 megahertz. I count 
through a one bit counter that's just going to go zero one zero one zero one zero one over the course of time which divides the frequency in half so what we've got here is we're sending it twelve and a half megahertz by default the z uh, uh, 180 boots up and it divides the clock we give it by two so it's really running at six and an eighth megahertz well this one's running at 25 therefore what happens is we have a whole lot of clock edges going up and down and up and down we have six of them on this signal here every time the s180's phi clock cycles once okay Therefore, when you look up here, when I instantiate the ROM, I can send that hardware clock out there for the clock that it's going to use. You can see I've tried a few other things to run it more asynchronously and see if I can get that to go. None of these seem to work. Well, they kind of work, but not really. It's because the timing's probably off in here. The setup and hold time of the address bus and then the output of the data. Yeah, we can, we can talk more about this at some other time. But right now, I just want to get proof of life out of this thing and move forward. So what I did is I ran this clock into that ROM. So what's happening then is that it's getting uh, just this clock clicks six times every time the clock in the in the 180 cycles once and we also know if we look in here at our timing information we looked at this once before let's see here where's mr timing here we see six cycles of our hardware clock every time phi cycles once do you think we have enough time if we use my hardware clock? We could probably even use the Phi clock to trigger this thing. This is free running, read enable, and clock enable are on, hard coded on as well. So what we're doing is we're just clocking the death out of this thing, saying, yeah, here, assume whatever you see on the address bus now is correct. Just give me the data for that. And it's doing this six times more often than Phi over here cycles. Notice that when it does an opcode fetch, the data has to be ready uh, just before the rising edge of T3. <laughs> okay. No, the RAM that's inside this FPGA, I haven't looked up the, uh, you know, the, the, the speed that it has, but I'm sure it could handle a 25 million uh, reads per second. That That's not a very high clock speed for an FPGA. So... <laughs> I'll bet we're ready, like, right here. We're probably ready before T1 even falls. As soon as this address is valid, we've got our data ready to go way over here. And we have all the way up until the roughly the rising edge of T3 before, or it looks like just before that. Let's call it the falling edge of T2. Right, we're ready before the rising edge of T2, for, for crying out loud. This will get it there in more than enough time to satisfy the fact that we want a, uh, a, a positive edge uh, pulse to let it know when the when the address is valid, all right? So this is just, you know, we're just beating the thing to death. Go, 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 even though we don't have to, okay? Otherwise, this is the same sort of thing we saw last time. We send the, the low nine bits of the address bus over to the memory module as, and ask it to get the data back into our ROM data bus, which we then uh, gate onto the uh, bus going back to the Z8S180 when it wants to read from memory, okay? Now, as you can see, I've added another condition in here. Uh, this one says if MREC is low when it's active, right, and the read line is low when it's active, and the address, all 16 bits of the address bus, or in this case, all 20 bits of the address bus, are less than hex 200, which is 512 bytes in decimal. So only the bottom 512 bytes will cause my FPGA here to send the data from the ROM data bus out onto the data bus for the Z80. Okay? The reason I'm doing this is I'm looking ahead to turning on the SRAM in the next example. So if I can get this to work, then we can move on to actually playing around with the real SRAM, okay? So what else has changed in here? You'll notice before I used to have 
CEO, EW, all these were nailed high along with all these pins up here. Don't wait. Don't generate interrupts. Don't do this. Don't turn on the uh, SRAM. In this case, I am now passing the read and the write signals through. I don't really need to gate them with MREC. This is just the De Morgan variation of what you saw above. Quite literally, when MREC is low and RD is low, it's the only time this OR function will output a zero. If either one of these is high, the output will be a one. So only when they're both zero do I want this to be zero, is what the equation says there. I could just as easily have just sent this over directly. Uh, is that true? Yes, I guess it is, because this also won't even enable the chip unless it's got a memory address, and the address is more than the 512. Okay, that we we require this one up here to be less than. Okay, so I don't want to have a bus conflict is what this is all about. So if the Z80S180 wants uh, something from the bottom, 512 bytes, it'll get it from the block RAM inside the FPGA. If it's 512 or more, no, it's greater than equal. So that we, we don't have an overlap and the cutover is exactly at 200. Uh, address 200 and more come out of the SRAM. In this example, we're never going to use it because the code that we run, that we looked at before, doesn't use anything above that. It'll only do this simple loop, and we've, this is the same loop we saw in the last program uh, example. And that is you put zero in the accumulator, you shut off the uh, refresh, and shut off the wait states. Get the lead out. Let's go, baby. Okay, and then we go into a loop like this. So we don't, in other words, we don't have to hand code everything. Now, granted, the out zero instructions are not supported by the cheesy assembler that I've been using because I'm using a regular a Z80 assembler, not a 180, and therefore it doesn't know what an out zero instruction is, doesn't know how to assemble this line, so I hand assembled that one myself. But anything else we do, most, all but like five or six instructions. Uh, are same as Z80 anyhow. The 180 is really a Z80 with a lot of uh, uh, you know in, uh, performance improvements and a few extra instructions. So this is one of the few extra ones that uh, older assemblers don't know about. So if we compile this thing up, and uh, we should probably check it for warnings, right? We should get uh, make all make make world. That's right. It's a special rule that I always like to put in there that forcibly cleans everything and starts over from scratch specifically so I can do something along these lines and look at the output since it all comes flying by the screen. Okay, there's our favorite tri-state warning. We talked about that before. There's Mr. Score griping about something for no reason. And then we have, there's the score warning summary. Then we go to route the board. I'm not using the S2 button that's in the PCF. And that's the summary of the warnings from place and route, which is the S2 button problem. So if I program this up, we should be able to go over the scope, clip some probes on, and see some cool stuff. Now we darken it down a little bit. We can see that it is working just fine. We're running the same code we ran before, and that is reading from address 8, 9, and 10. And this is what we would expect to see on the LEDs because the this is 1, 2, 4, and 8 in terms of their contribution to the value of the address. So this is the least significant bit here. So when we're all these have this LED here on for the value 8, this one and that one is 9, this LED and that one is the 10, and then it goes back to not 8, 9, 10 over and over. So this is exactly what we would expect to see in terms of brightness on these LEDs. If we look over at the scope, what I got here is these two, you can see the cursors, the left and right cursor. We see one, two, three, phi uh, signals. That's the purple trace is the phi clock. You see the M1 is the yellow trace at the top of the scope, and that's where the trigger is connected to M1. So what we see is for two full periods of the phi clock, M1 is low, and then the third full period, it is high. The next instruction would... Um, come after that if it was moving on to the next instruction right away. In this case, it is not because we're executing a jump instruction in a spin loop, and that requires it to read three 
bytes before it moves on to the next instruction. So the next M1 cycle, if I zoom the scope way out, let's see here. We now see two M1 cycles on the scope, and if you count out all the five clocks, we're going to see three, six, nine to handle the jump instruction, and then go on to the next one. And M1 goes low, we see three, five clocks for each one of the bus cycles that it's using to read the values out of memory. And if you remember back to the, uh, the Z80 Retro series of videos I did, and we looked at the timing diagrams over there, I believe that the upcode fetch took place over five clock cycles. This goes all the way down to three. So <laughs> we're already going way faster, even with the same clock, uh, clock frequency, to run the chip. And of course, this chip can go uh, at least twice as fast as our Z80 did on the Retro board. If I move the probe now, the top one, the yellow trace, which you remember is also the trigger trace, that is now moved over to the right output signal. And you can see now uh, more closely that uh, three phi cycles equals one whole instruction period. But you can also see that we're on the falling edge of the phi clock when the memory request signal goes low and becomes active, okay? So what we're looking at is M1 falls on the rising edge of the phi clock, and the very next edge, which is the first falling edge after the M1 signals go goes active, we see the memory request going active, okay? And we see it stays active for, what is this, one two and a half full five periods getting back to our uh our edges to trigger the the uh the block ram with remember i said we could use the phi clack we could use the extal line and we can use hardware clock all those are running two and six times faster than the purple trace we see on the scope right now now, before we leave here, I'm going to move the, the, the probes around again. The top trace, the yellow trace, is the trigger, which is on M1, and the bottom one is on M rec. We can zoom in a little bit here. We can definitely see that uh, the right signal goes low, a half a cycle, half of a five period after the M1 goes active. Not that that's critical to our design or anything. I just wanted to have a look-see while we were in the neighborhood. You know, while we're in the neighborhood, let's go ahead and try a few other ideas here, right? Let's go ahead and hook this up to Phi. It does come back in, right? Phi is right here. We know it's in our, in our bus. So we, we see it on the LED, right? So this is a slower clock. You know, it'll be six times the, uh, you know, slower than, than the hardware clock. But even this is going to work, I'm pretty darn sure, I'm very sure, in fact, that that'll be fine. What is not fine are these two down here, and I think it's because the read uh, signal goes low or high, uh, way out at the extreme edges of the MREC, as shown right here, okay? These are pretty much going to happen, right? Really close to the same time. Not exactly. They have different ratings. You can see by these numbers here. This is 8 and that's 9 from the same reference. And this is 13 and 12 from this reference. But roughly, they're, uh, you know, almost coincident in time. So we cannot be certain that the sample time that is used to collect the data here is reasonably after this rising edge, if at all. In fact, I think it's, what it says, the hold has to be 16 after this, and blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of a bummer. What we need is an edge somewhere in here, and that's fine. We have one, this is the weight state, so we have actually two. I suspect if we just did it right here and no earlier, we'd be fine, okay? And in fact, in a way, that's what we are doing. By, by doing it repeatedly all the way through this uh, uh, the period of time that the address is stable, which is what we're doing with our hardware clock that's running six times faster than phi, uh, that's really kind of what's happening, and we have more than enough time. So if we do it on these rising edges, as long as the address is stable, 
on the rising edge of T2, I think we're fine. In fact, I think the sample's done relative to the falling edge of T3 over here. So I suspect even if all we did is it on the rising edge of T3, we'd be fine. So I suspect that this will work, and it will be nice to just verify that, check my theory. So let's go ahead and do this. And if we boot it up and look back at our scope, we can see clearly with M1 on the top here and the 5 clock on the bottom that it is working perfectly fine and dandy. So this appears to be very safe and reasonable to do. You know, I'll leave these as the task for the viewer if you really want to test those other ones out and see it not working. So if we move on now to the Grand Slam. This is why I put these test programs in here. Let's check both now the, 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 the memory block inside the FPGA and the SRAM itself. Well, let's see how we're going to do this. This code in here is identical to the one we just ran. But uh, I did just change it. So let's go ahead and make that change in here as well. Let's go ahead and run it with five. And one of the reasons is to run the slower clock in here, by the way, is because the number of edges that you send through the FPGA and have it doing work as a result of is proportional to the power consumption. So this will use less power, even though it's probably going to be immeasurably less, but it, maybe one microamp? I, I don't know how much that's going to be, but every little bit helps, and it'll be less noisy, et cetera, et cetera, inside the FPGA. So you can see down here, the SRAM still hooked up the same way. We're clocking. Oh, there is a difference. We did make a difference. We'll come back to that after we look at the software. Uh, but otherwise, we're the same up here, and I just did the five clock. Okay, so let's look at the software. The memory should be the same, right? Yes, please, let something be the same, right? Yeah, there's no changes here. And let's look at the rom.asm file. Okay, here's what we're going to do in here. We're going to turn off the refresh and, and the wait states. This is a little bit different loop this time. Look what's happening here. We're going to put a 3 into the accumulator. And the reason I do that is because, I mean, I should have done this in binary to make it more obvious, right? But we all know that a 3 is 0000011 in binary. 3 hex equals that in binary, okay? And you can even put, I think, uh, this assembler would allow you to put an underscore or maybe a dollar in there and stuff like that, uh, which would allow you to space these out, like putting commas between you know groups of thousands when in decimal and stuff like that, uh, so that make it more readable if you want. But that's what we're looking at here, okay? Now, I wonder if you use the zero x notation like I did down here. It's good to be using as many different notations as possible, all in the same example. <laughs> Keep the reader on their toes, yes? Anyway, the point is, you got all zeros followed by two ones. You can put anything in here, and in this program would still work. The reason I chose this is because what happens is, when I output a zero to one of the LEDs on the FPGA board, and you saw that was the code that's different. We'll come back to that in a minute. If we output this value to the LEDs, I'll have on, 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 off, off. And these two off in a row, surrounded by these on LEDs, will be very visible, okay? And that's the whole goal of this thing. What are we doing down here? Our friend, the LDIR, we talked about this at some length in the series on the Z80 Retro, and we were getting ready to initialize and clear out the memory and load up for CPM. And what that does is it repeatedly uh, copies memory from one place to another. Well, how does it work? Well, you take the, 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 the from address, you store that in HL, and that's hex 2000. And as we saw earlier, hex 2000 is the first byte that will be addressable in the SRAM chip on the S180 board that plugs into our FPGA board. So this is the lowest address that that thing 
will respond to, and I should, I'm sitting here talking slowly because clearly <laughs> that starts at 200. Okay, I'm going to store the value in the accumulator into the into memory at the first byte that this thing's copying from. And that puts the three in there, okay? The destination for my copy is one byte later at 201. The total number of bytes that'll be copied go into the BC register pair, and that's FDFF, which is exactly the number you need to copy exactly all 64K of the 16-bit address minus... 512, which is hex 200, minus the one that you already stored yourself, because that's going to be hex 0201 up through FFFF. And this instruction will make that full copy. So what I'm doing is I'm going to copy from 200 to 201, and because I just stuck that in memory, the address in HL, that means there's a 3 stored in memory at hex 200. I'm going to read from this down here. It's going to read the value stored in hex 200. Then it's going to write it into 201. Then it's going to decrement the BC register pair, and it's going to say if BC is not zero, do it again. It'll then read from the address that's in HL and copy it into DE and so on. Now, every time LDIR runs, I forgot to mention what it does to HL and DE. It will decrement, it'll, while it decrements the BC pair, to see if it's done, I always thought of that as the byte count. Coincidental that the B and C pairs were used for that, and the B and C register pair was used for that. Okay. It will also increment the HL after it does the read. Then it will increment the DE, which I like to think of as the destination address, after it does the write. So when LDIRR runs, okay, <laughs> one more time, it reads from the address that's in the HL register, and while it's doing that, it adds one to HL. Then it writes the value into the DE register, uh, into memory at the DE register's uh, contents, and simultaneously adds one to the DE register. Then it decrements the BC pair, and if it's not zero, it doesn't over and over and over and over. Okay, so what this is going to do, it allows us to use a really simple, sloppily written, sloppily explained <laughs> program to test our RAM. Think about this for a second. We have to write a value in the accumulator into the SRAM, then read it back to copy it into the second byte location from 200 to 201. Then we do it again. We copy it from 201 to 202. Then we copy it from 202 to 203, and so on. In order for this value, 3, to be 3 and valid and correct, by the time LDIR copies the byte into the very last address, all the way up at FFFF in hex, it has to have successfully written and then read back every byte in the RAM from 200 to FFFE. If anything is wrong in there, and any of those bits are off, then by the time it has read, copy, read, write, read, write, read, write, all the way up to the last byte, it will most likely be corrupted. Okay? So, if we only could know what value was written into FFFF when this instruction ends, like we could read it back out and save it on the LEDs or something like that, then we could know, or have some faith, because obviously errors in your RAM would cancel themselves out in this trivial test, right? But we could be relatively assured that the SRAM is kind of most likely working, okay, within some reason. I then, when I'm done with that whole thing, I rotate A right, which means you take the least significant bit and you put it up here at the most significant one, you move everything else over. So after this thing is done, the first time around here, it'll change the 3 into a hexadecimal 81, because that would be a 1, triple zero, and then a triple zero and a 1 down here. Okay, And then I say, go back up here and do it again. So when it comes up here now, a has a hex 81 in it, and it does the whole thing all over again. Ripples through all the RAM until there's an 81 stored in FFFF. Then it does this again, and now it's going to get a C0. 
because that's a one one zero 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 zero. That's what rotate does. And it goes around and around and around and around and around. This is going to let us know two things. If we watch what is stored in address FFFF on the LEDs, we'll know how long it takes to do one single LDIR. For, and we'll also know if the RAM is any good. If it's just garbage flashy lights or something, or they don't do anything at all, then the RAM is bad, or the program's bad, something's bad. But if we have all ons with, with two off LEDs, and then it kind of leaps around, and we see this uh, the, the off LEDs on the outer edge, and then we see these two go off, and the rest are on, then it'll inchworm its way across, those will be off, and the rest will be on, and then it inchworms over again, Okay we'll know how fast the CPU is really going, okay? So if it takes like a whole second before it goes from these two LEDs to these two LEDs, we know the CPU is going pretty slow. But if it's going zoom and zoom and round, around round, round real fast, we know we're going pretty good, okay? Again, just a rough back of the, uh, <laughs> back of the envelope type of calculation here, just a quick sanity test. Now let's go back and look at top.v because I said if, 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 when we're looking at the code, how do we watch what's sitting in memory at address FFFF? First we learn to type. Then we look at what's going on uh, in here. Look what's happening in here. What do I got here? I got a reg variable set to FFFF. Actually, this is a kind of a confusing name to call a variable. <laughs> I have a variable called FFFF, okay? The reason I called it that is because FFFF is the name of a variable that holds the contents of memory from FFFF. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to create then a wire signal called FFFFWE, which to me means the right enable for F for address FFFF, and that will be true when we have what? The chip enable for the SRAM is active, and the write enable is active, so there's our De Morgan again. When CE is low and WE is low, this expression is zero. All other times it is a one. I then invert that. So this signal here will be true and high, if the SD RAM or the SRAM, sorry, is enabled for writing and the address bus has this address on it. So what I've done here is I've decoded an address, and this is kind of wonky actually. In in Verilog, this is done, doing a Boolean bit and operation, which is actually okay because this is a bit and the results of this expression are a bit. You could just as easily put a double ampersand in there and use a logical compare as well, which might have been more illustratively uh, clear, but nonetheless, this is correct in this case, okay? And so what this is true is when we, we, we are writing to address 65, you know, FFFF in the SRAM, okay? And what are we going to do on the negative edge of this thing? So that it'll go true, and then it'll go false. And I want the negative edge being, that's the point in time when I know the data will be valid, okay? You don't want to really store this in the positive edge, because it may not make the setup time at that point. On the negative edge, we know we've had more than enough time for the for the processor to have the data out and, and everything else is valid and stable uh, before uh, you know on the data bus and before we store it into our FFFF uh, register. Okay, and then the other differences in this file is that the LEDs show me the contents of my FFFF register. Uh-huh, okay. So what all this stuff is doing is it's saying, let me look at a copy of what is last written into the SRAM memory at this address. And because of what I explained earlier, the only way that this value here can actually be recognizably correct and have all ones and two zero or all LEDs on with two of the LEDs off 
is if and only if every single byte of memory from hex 200 all the way up to FFFE, and if you want to be a, a stickler for detail, was properly re uh, written into and read back out of. Okay, so this is a pretty decent sanity test, in my opinion, of the SRAM. If this thing works and it creates a, like a you know an inchworm type display on the LEDs, then you know we're pretty much sure that we're okay. And I gotta tell you that when when this thing first started working, I was very happy. <laughs> this is great because it means that. You know, our signal integrity is pretty reasonable on the Project 2067 board because if it wasn't, there would probably be all kinds of glitches and it wouldn't be that stable, right? Uh, there would probably be enough errors where we might see the lights flicker from time to time. And it's running slow enough that we can see each individual LDIR instruction. Now, we, I suppose we could speed it up. Let's do that. <laughs> if you wanted to try speeding this thing up now i didn't read the spec very closely here okay the um if we gave what if we just assigned to the external crystal the xtal input if we just set the hardware clock directly in here Okay, it would be running twice as fast as it does in this implementation right here, and that would be 25 megahertz. So let's comment this out. Now, the, the chip that I have on my board is rated, it says 20 megahertz, not 25. But what I don't know, because I haven't read all, I, not recently anyway, <laughs> uh, I don't know if that is the maximum speed for phi or if that's the maximum speed for EXTEL. I don't care. Let's let her fly. <laughs> See what happens. I know that the uh, that it'll run at 20 megahertz, but I don't know, like I said, I don't know what they refer to at 20. I also know that I can tell the chip to run the Phi clock at the same speed as the crystal here. So it might be to achieve 20 the right way would be to run this at 20 and then tell it not to cut it in half inside the sock but uh, let's just see what happens let's just see if this doubles the speed and runs reliably i suspect it will yeah baby <laughs> that's looking pretty good i can't wait to uh, start looking at uh, bigger and better things see if we can design in an F spi peripheral to run the sd card and some other fun stuff and really go to town with this. This is going to be a lot of fun. See you next time. Thanks for watching. <laughs>